Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Shirish Kapoor. I'm the president and principal of King's College. Uh, and it is a particular privilege to welcome you here. Now, um, my first order of instruction was to let you know that we are being recorded and to check if that was working well for everyone. I'm being given a thumbs up, which is a good sign. Um, I don't want to be uh, a, in, in way of the people you really come here to listen, and that's our panel. But I did want to tell you as to how this came about, because it is the presidential series on academic freedom. But the way it came about is because of Professor Livio Matei, because uh, I was new to King's, and I think, Livio, you were new to King's too. And something that struck both of us is that while the world outside of universities was talking a lot about academic freedom and freedom of speech and university professors and vice chancellor were being hauled in front of commi commissions and committees, inside the universities there wasn't much of a discussion about it. Um, and, and we thought, what an odd thing, because usually there is a lot of hoo-ha in the university and no one outside even cares about it. So this was an odd inversion, and we thought it was very important that we get into the debate, partly because the world was taking a rather simplistic stance to what we thought was the question of academic freedom, which is a really broad concept, often ill-defined, and easily confused with a lot of other things. And I think what particularly worried us was that because the reigning political concern was about the sort of wokeness on campus, we were actually mistaking freedom of speech to be all that academic freedom is about. And hopefully the topic today will try and address whether these are coextensive, whether they overlap, and if they overlap in what they, ways they do, or whether they really are exclusive concepts and could both exist in different ways. And therefore, um, we're really delighted this is a series, this is the second in the series, and our hope is to get this conversation going, and I don't think we could have found a better panel and a better chair for the panel. So it is my privilege now to hand over to Professor David Willits, uh, who in his past life has been a universities minister, and most in the universities are still pining for the days when you were the universities <laughs> minister. So David, I don't think you need an introduction. Often people say, well, he ne needs no introduction, but then they go on to introduce him. No, he needs no introduction. David Willits. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, the, um, uh, well, Really, what, we, what we're going to do is you're going to hear from our excellent panel in a moment. But as you've already heard from Shidij, and it's, it's wonderful that he has promoted and encouraged this event, we're, we're first going to hear from Livio himself, who has thought more about academic freedom than just about anyone else, with the exception, of course, of our panelists. And, the, uh, and Livio is, is very interested in finding some distinct space for academic freedom as distinct from freedom of speech. It's an issue which we have been wrestling with in Parliament with the current legislation uh, going through. And uh, I was able to get some amendments to that yesterday, which are not a full reversal of talk, but at least get us some compromise, some constraints on, on talk. But the, the bit which, as the bill has proceeded through the Commons and the Lords, we probably haven't investigated as much as we should have done, is what academic freedom means. The government, I think, has got more and more nervous about it, and it is a shrinking part of the bill. Um, and I may touch on that again in a moment when I open the panel. But Livy, first of all, you have thought about this. You have strong views. Why don't you set the ball rolling? Well, thank you very much, uh, David, and, uh, and Shitish. Actually, I'm only responsible for the logistics uh, of, this, uh, of this series. Of course, there's always an intellectual dimension to any logistics exercise. So I wanted to remind uh, all of you, I mean, Shitish did it already, that this is the second uh, event in this presidential series. And because not all of you were there for the, for the first event, I mean, the, the topic then was, uh, or the question then was, is there a need to reimagine academic freedom? And there was a good degree of consensus, if I can speak of degrees of consensus, that yes, there is a need to reimagine academic freedom it's not the end of the world, but there is a need about it, and universities should play a role. So that was the main conclusion. And now uh, we also discussed that if this is really the case, there is a need to reimagine academic freedom, universities should play a role in, on, on that. Uh, how should we do it? And also this idea emerged during the first session that perhaps at the end of this series, we can come up with a set of principles 
for uh, uh, for reimagining academic freedom. We can or we may. Who 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 knows? So by way of uh, of uh, reminding ourselves uh, where we want to go eventually, I just wanted to to propose one candidate for uh, th this set of principles, which is this very idea that uh, academic freedom and freedom of speech are both important, they overlap to some extent, they are not enemies of each other or they shouldn't be enemies of each other. However, there is a big risk and this is there is a trend nowadays, not only in the UK, but in the UK as well, to misconstrue academic freedom as freedom of speech alone. And this is counterproductive and this is uh, dangerous. So I leave it to the panel if they wish even to consider this proposal for a candidate principle for this list that we may end up with in fall this, this year. And thank you so much for uh, accepting the invitation to be members of the panel today and to be, to be here with us. Thank you, David. I don't think you need this. No, I think we got this. Thank you. Well, um, let me start very briefly by setting the scene, and then we will hear in succession from Nicola, from Naomi, and from Franz. But um, I just, and they will approach this with much greater um, uh, theoretical kind of sophistication. I just want to give you a couple of examples um, of where uh, the issues which we have to wrestle with, and my belief that often academic freedom is very closely related to academic autonomy. It is not the same. A university is not speaker's corner writ large, and academic events and seminars are certainly not speaker's corner writ large. They take place within a framework of a discipline. And one of the most important powers that the academic community has is to shape and police the boundaries of their own discipline, which helps define what is speech that falls within that discipline and what is outside it. And one of the most interesting uh, and brave campaigners for a form of academic freedom was a, uh, an academic that I met in the Middle East uh, when I was there on one of my uh, official visits when I was the minister. And this guy was a scientist, and he had uh, at one point lost his job at a university in the Middle East, but then had been reappointed. And the issue on which he had campaigned, and which led to him win it, losing his job, but eventually winning his campaign, is that there was a requirement that the Islamic account of creation should be taught as part of the science degree at his university. And he said that is a set of religious beliefs, uh, but I do not accept that the Islamic account of creation should be part of what we teach as the science course, and I'm not willing to have it in the science course. And our role as academics is to define what constitutes science and what doesn't constitute science. This is a legitimate view of the world, but it's not a scientific view of the world. And the authorities initially insisted it should be part of the uh, curriculum, and he fought and lost and resigned, or was sacked. But eventually, because of pressure more widely from the academic community, eventually the university authorities retreated and accepted that they would not require the Islamic account of creation to be taught as part of science, and he was welcomed back on the campus to teach the science discipline. He was fighting for a sort of academic freedom, and that was a freedom not to teach something that he did not regard as part of a legitimate discipline. Um, and, that, and if you look at some of the US arguments about evolution in the curriculum, there is a similar issue. It isn't a right to teach creationism, it's the opposite. It's a right of science teachers not to teach creationism and to regard creationism as not a part of the discipline and having no protections as part of that discipline. That's the strand of academic freedom that most interests me. And I think applying it to legislation now going through parliament, you can then speculate 
about a potential conflict. Liv, you have said that the two principles are all absolutely fine, but what if someone is um, obliged to leave the faculty because he or she is not teaching what is regarded as the body of science within that, di within that discipline. And of course, um, um, a delicate error, I think, is pretty much established now, but what if there is an environmental scientist who does not accept man-made uh, carbon dioxide emissions to drive climate change and wishes to teach that as part of the university course, whatever it may be. Um, and academic freedom, I think, would give the faculty the right to say this, you can say that, you can stand at speaker's corner and say it. You can write it in a newspaper article. It's a free country, but you can't teach it as part of our curriculum. And what if he or she says, I have a right of freedom to speak as an academic, reinforced by this legislation, and you are getting rid of me because of my opinions. And in a way, he is being got rid of because of his opinions. His opinions are not thought to be part of the settled shape of a Discipline, it's his opinions that are indeed the problem. And how down the track we wrestle with those sorts of dilemmas, the autonomy of academics to shape and police the boundaries of their own discipline is I think a very interesting question that I hope we'll be able to consider this evening. So that was just my opening intervention. We're now gonna hear from someone who has wrestled with it as well, Dame Nicola Dandridge, who was uh, Chief Executive of Universities UK, Chief Executive of the Office of Students, is now Professor of Higher Education Policy at the University of Bristol, uh, and has thought long and hard about this and other issues. Nicola, over to you. Thank you very much, David. I wish I could say I had thought long and hard about academic freedom, because the truth is I have thought long and hard about free speech, and I think that's exactly the problem that we are dealing with today, that I, like so many others, have been so concerned and focused about free speech that I think we haven't given academic freedom enough attention. Now, in terms of what I'm going to say um, this evening, uh, David, you, you, you implied that um, I uh, was going to speak about with some degree of theoretical sophistication. Can I just put the record straight? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> because what I agreed with Livio I would do is look at this from um, a more regulatory perspective, because that's my background. But I, can I make it absolutely clear? I am not speaking anymore for the OFS. I left a year ago. I do not know what their thinking is on these sorts of things. So I'm speaking entirely in my own capacity. But nonetheless, what has been fascinating is thinking about this um, question of academic freedom. I went back to the legislation which set up the OFS because the, the Higher Education Research Act 2017 has got um, issues of ac academic freedom in the legislation, which at the OFS we then followed through in the regulatory framework. And what is really interesting is that the legislative um, provisions which actually predated the 1970, 2017 Act were focused on academic freedom, not free speech. I hadn't quite realised that's where it came from. So the 1988 Act was um, academic freedom. The 2017 Act was academic freedom with no reference to free speech. And then what happened is when the OFS, when I was there, was drafting the regulatory framework, we introduced free speech because there was perceived to be a real problem in the sector about free speech, which incidentally I think there really is. So I am perhaps in a small minority that believe there is a case for the bill. Not the tort, by the way. I think that is a, a real mistake. I'm going to come on to that, actually. I'm quite concerned about that, particularly in the context of academic freedom. But nonetheless, the regulatory framework for which um, I was, um, together with all the colleagues and many others following consultation responsible, were, were responsible, introduced um, free speech. And what's then happened is that we've tipped away from academic freedom and now are obsessing about free speech for all the reasons you'll be well aware for, of. And therefore, Livio, I absolutely agree. I think there is a very strong case for trying to pull the pendulum back and, and get a better balance between the two because they are very different. Now, um, what has remained broadly consistent throughout that period is the definition of academic freedom in the bill, in the legislation, in the regulatory framework. Um, freedom of the, within the law to question and test received wisdom, put forward new ideas and controversial or unpopular opinions without placing um, 
yourself at risk of losing your job and privilege. Um, sorry, that's a bit of a garbled version, but you'll probably be familiar with it. Um, what I think is um, interesting is that what this is going to do, that definition, particularly in the free speech bill, is create a definition which, even though in Livio's fantastic papers, is asserting that academic freedom should be much broader than that. It should represent a broadly framed value. I think by having that quite tight definition in the bill, it's going to shape the way we perceive academic freedom into the future. What I think is interesting about that definition, firstly, is what it excludes. It's narrow. It's specific. It's not a value. It only extends to academics and not to students. Um, and it, it really only extends to the ability to question um, conventional wisdom and put forward ideas. It doesn't deal with the broader contextual environment, such as you know, the, the, the research environment in which academics are operating. Um, and it doesn't extend, for example, to uh, funding. Um, it doesn't extend to security of tenure. So all the things we see in the American AAUP, for example, their decisions, it doesn't really go in, go in that direction. It's, it, it's quite narrowly defined. And um, I think, just as an example, the sort of situation that we often see is when academics are under real pressure because of external third-party influences, social media, critiquing what they're doing in terms of their academic research. Um, that definition doesn't necessarily cover it. Having said that, I think there are other provisions in the bill which requires governing bodies and indeed the OFS to provide a, uh, to, to take steps to be proactive in promoting academic freedom. So I think probably it would be captured in that way, but it's certainly not caught directly by the definition. I should say none of this prevents a university from adopting a broader definition of academic freedom in their, in their governing papers, and I'm sure King's and all others will want to do that. What is included um, is um, an academic expressing views now outside their field of expertise. I think that is really challenging, actually, if it's going to be embodied in a law which provides academics with the right to pursue a civil claim against the university. Um, in your covering paper, actually, so you gave the example of, a, of, a, of an academic who is normally precluded from coming out with outlandish ideas or advocating particular political opinion in a maths lesson. That's actually not excluded from the definition in the bill. So I think this could be um, quite challenging. Likewise, uh, and it's rather picking up and extending David's point, um, there are no exemptions in the bill as to, for example, how an academic can teach. And with my former regulatory hat on, I was thinking, well, what if the academic is teaching a curriculum which is out of date? or isn't very good, or their teaching methods are rather poor. All the sort of things that when I was at the OFS we used to get very worried about, um, particularly actually out-of-date curriculum, which is a real challenge. Would that academic again be able to assert mm -hmm. academic freedom? And that, um, I think, would be less of a challenge if this was being mediated through the Director for Free Speech and Academic Freedom within the OFS, because they have responsibility for quality and all standards, all those sorts of things. So, so there could be a, a sensible di direction. If this is handed over to the courts, who will have no um, immediate understanding of those, the complexities of quality and standards, I simply don't know where this will end up. So I think to conclude, the more I've thought about this, the more I think this is really mm -hmm. challenging. Um, I, I, I think that, um, ha that I am supportive of the bill because I think there is a problem about free speech. And I think giving more explicit powers to um, uh, and responsibilities to universities is, is, is a good thing. Um, but I think um, academic freedom is too important, too fundamental to be restricted and captured in the way that it is in the bill. Um, and um, I hope that we'll be able to make some modification. I'm looking to you, David, here, um, in terms of the bill. Um, but failing that, um, I think as a sector, we are going to have to work really hard to make sense of this. As I say, it's a rather negative presentation, but I do it because actually academic freedom is really fundamentally important. But I think the way this has been constructed is not necessarily as helpful as it could be. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid there's not much more scope for changing the bill now. We changed it a bit yesterday, but 
we will see it's, it's, um, it's getting towards the end of its parliamentary stages. Anyway, we're now going to hear from Dr. Naomi Waltham-Smith, who is a reader and deputy chair of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Warwick. And she also chairs the Academic Freedom Review Committee and sits on the Council at Warwick and wrestles with this, therefore, both as a philosopher and a practitioner. Over to you, Naomi. Thank you, Dan. I should also clarify, I am speaking in my capacity as an individual academic, exercising my academic freedom, <laughs> and not speaking as a trustee of the University of Warwick. Um, although I think our policy is, uh, captures much of the spirit of, of what I will be saying. So unlike Livy, I'm not actually persuaded that academic freedom is quite such an elusive concept. I think if we look beyond English law, and if we look beyond UK institutions, we see whether it's in the US, as Nicola has referred to, or whether it's in Australia, or whether it's in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, we find quite clear conceptions of what academic freedom is. And while they differ from one another, there are sufficient family resemblances among them for us to draw a set of principles. And I think, I'm, I'm hoping that also as part of the work in reimagining academic freedom, we'll draw on that reservoir uh, of instruments, but also on a lot of academic work that has been done in this area. And I also perhaps somewhat in jest would like to suggest that it's perhaps not so much of a problem if the concept of academic freedom isn't so settled, because it would be precisely part of academic freedom to question and test uh, the definition and conditions of itself. Um, so I'm a little bit more comfortable with this being somewhat subject to the kind of debate that I think academic freedom is there to protect. But I am going to offer a principle. I will take up your invitation with you and suggest a principle uh, and here it's designed to distinguish academic freedom from free speech, but also goes in a somewhat different direction from two tendencies that we see in existing definitions. One is via an appeal to truth as the telos of academic inquiry, as its main objective, as a defender of the truth. Uh, the other is a tendency to enumerate a series of categories or types of activity that should be protected, chiefly through uh, a number of pillars, freedom of research, freedom of teaching, of professional association, of collegial self-governance, and of expression. What I'm going to suggest instead is that we define and distinguish academic freedom um, by the fact that it is, it is discerning as to quality. So unlike, David, your case at Speaker's Corner, as I think you're suggesting here, there is some bounds to the scope of the kinds of expression and activity that is appropriate and proper to the space of the university. Yeah. And I would like to say that rather than disciplinary boundaries, especially in a landscape of increasing inter and transdisciplinarity, that we might instead like to define academic freedom as expression that is amenable to critique and rebuttal, by which I intend to exclude uh, speech that would be mere propaganda, mere dogma, or sophistry. And I'm not the first to express this kind of concern. Uh, the great liberal thinker, J.S. Mill, with whom I perhaps in other respects have little in common, drew attention to this issue, particularly of sophistry, although he thought it was impossible to legislate on it. Um, maybe some universities will like to try in their policies. So a little bit now about the bill and how it relates uh, to having set the scene here. So I think the bill, it doesn't simply reduce academic freedom to freedom of expression, but I think more dangerously it confuses or er erodes the boundaries between the two. Uh, it's not a straightforward reduction. And that this, I think, has quite serious implications for the mission and culture of our universities, which I'll come back to at the end. So as Livio has said, the bill is chiefly about free speech on campus, but it does uh, mention academic freedom using that definition that Nicola uh, brought up for us that I think, as you've rightly demonstrated, is quite thin, quite narrow, and I would say overly vague as well. Um, and we could have made use of uh, some more sophisticated definitions. This was an opportunity in English law to rectify that that has been somewhat missed. However, the bill um, provides a, a distinction between uh, two kinds of process duty. Um, 
one that is there for the ordinary speech of visiting speakers, of non-academics, and academics who are not employed by the institution. And then an enhanced process duty for academic employees of the institution. But for substantive legal protection, it's necessary to turn to the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Um, and say a little bit about what that is and how the bill is not aligned with that and the problems that produces. So in Strasbourg, there is a well-recognized, uh, calibrated hierarchy of protection under Article 10 for free speech, uh, with ordinary free speech having the lowest level of protection, public interest and political speech having uh, greater protection, a serious degree of protection, and then academic freedom of expression, which is given utmost or the highest level of protection. It would, of course, be very tidy if the reasonably practicable steps in our legislation, upcoming legislation, were to be calibrated onto that hierarchy. But that's probably more than I, I couldn't wish for. Um, but Strasbourg is also, and maybe David would be glad to hear this, is not saying that any speech counts as academic freedom of expression. It's qualified and suitably so. And in two important regards, one we've touched on already. So Strasbourg doesn't say it's limited to field of expertise, but rather to the areas of research, professional competence and expertise of the academic, which includes, I would suggest, things like one's understanding of pedagogic theory, perhaps knowledge one has acquired of financial strategy from sitting on committees and of university governance. So is much kind of broader in, in that way, um, but is narrower than what the bill has for the enhanced process duty, though not substantive protection. So there's a gap here that's opened up here between the two uh, sources of law. The other qualification in the European Court of Human Rights is for professional standards. And it applies a similar kind of principle as it does to journalists, which says that if you're not abiding by uh, normal research ethics or integrity, then you're not going to get protection at the utmost level of academic freedom of protection, though you may get a lower level for free speech, uh, ordinary free speech. The other thing it does is recognize um, the importance as part of academic freedom of the ability to criticize one's own institution, I won't do that today, um, or the system in which one works. And this is even where it brings your institution into disrepute. I had fun telling our vice chancellor that. And um, that will be provided it's not ad hominem or gratuitously offensive. Um, uh, so there's some limit and needs to be made in good faith, reasonable, practical, uh, factual basis, and so on. Um, but it, it's something that institutions don't often recognize. So just really to conclude, I would say that there's quite a considerable risk if the Human Rights Act, which incorporates the convention rights, were to be repealed, or if the UK were to leave the convention altogether, and that the current legislation or the proposals to bolster free speech in the Bill of Rights Bill would be inadequate to protect academic freedom as a distinct category. So my final summing up point is to say that what this could have some fairly serious ramifications for higher education uh, and for the future, indeed, of democratic society, because the ability, this function of a critical conscience or watchdog that universities provide for democratic societies hinges on this culture, community of practice, of criticality. And if that is lost and not protected, but is instead dissolved into a free for all of expression and opinion, we risk threatening our democracy as well as our education. Thank you very much. Philosophers are so useful, aren't they? Awesome. <laughs> that is fantastic. Thank you very much, Naomi. Now we're going to hear from Professor Franz Burkhout, who is assistant principal here, a professor of environment, society, and climate. He joined King's in 2013 and was the executive dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Public Policy as well. Franz, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, I mean, I'm absolutely the least qualified to be on this panel, but I was delighted to accept Liviu's um, invitation. I think the reason I'm here is because I was for three years co-chair of something called the Freedom of, of Expression Standing Advisory Group here at King's, which advises, is a joint committee, actually, interestingly, of the university and the students' union, joint co-chaired, 
uh, by uh, the president of the union and uh, an academic, advises the principal on free freedom of expression and oversees the implementation of King's policy in that area, which is quite developed and, uh, and so on. I mean, I should say that I, I start from a sort of naive and classical liberal position uh, that says that a university, uh, in a university, we should be maximizing the space for the free exchange of ideas, uh, and that that should be in good faith and with minimal constraints imposed by the law. I mean, that's the principle that we used. You were not allowed to do incitement to violence uh, if you were speaking, and we were mainly regulating external speakers, and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia was, was, was prohibited. But beyond that, broadly, we protected anyone's right to say more or less anything. Um, and uh, we were very determined not to have a cancel culture at King's. And I think we were able to you know, entertain all sorts of people here who, who had, had complicated uh, uh, opinions. I want to make three points. The first is that the boundaries about what, and this is repeating a bit what David said, the boundaries about what are legitimate knowledge claims and opinions are socially constructed, I'm a social scientist, I should say, and heavily policed, very heavily policed, both within the academy but often from outside as well. Um, and therefore, academic freedom and free, freedom of expression is always about a struggle, about the policing of that boundary of what is true and just and so on. And so I think David's point is absolutely right there. And I'll give you an example of that. Secondly, there's a very complex relationship, and people have made this point as well, between academic freedom and freedom of expression. It's not straightforward at all, and it's often very ambiguous in the reality and the practicalities of a given case. And thirdly, actually, I, I disagree with um, uh, Nicola on this, that in a university, both academic staff and students should be covered by the rights and responsibilities of academic freedom as well as freedom of expression. I'll, I'll just e explain what I mean there. So the case study is quite simple. In the room below here, in late January 2020, uh, the KCL Turkish Society, which is a student society, had invited Kudret Ozersay, uh, who was, and I think still is, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus to speak at an evening event called Cyprus Status Quo or Anew. The event was held, as I said, in a, in a teaching room below here. Now, for those of you who don't know, the um, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus was created after the war of 1974, when Turkey invaded Cyprus and occupied a, a small area. Um, it's a small state with about 300,000 people, and, uh, but it has a sort of, uh, uh, it, it exists with, with a boundary and a, and, a, and, a, and a government. As the head of FISAG, I was first alerted to this by a delegation of students from the KCL Hellenic Society who asked for an urgent meeting, at which they argue, argue and this was in the room just above here, uh, that since the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, uh, Cyprus, uh, Cyprus was an illegitimate pseudo-state recognized only by Turkey, um, their political representatives, that is the Deputy Prime Minister, should not be welcomed at King's. We were um, cons you know, conspiring in an illegitimate political act by accepting this person to be here. At the same time, the King's College London Alumni Greece Facebook page posted a message, which is a long message condemning the fact that uh, this person was being allowed to come here. And it said, the provision of a footing and the promotion of falsified testimony of the so-called state of Northern Cyprus is upsetting and at the same time deeply troubling towards the academic community of the University of London and graduates of King's College London. So upsetting and deeply troubling. <coughs> the visit was also covered in the Cypriot press and mentioned in a Greek parliamentary debate in the days leading up to the event. More than that, on the day before the event, I received a telephone call from a former UK ambassador to Greece who requested, using the same arguments about illegitimacy uh, and falsity, that the event not be held at King's College London. I use the argument about academic freedom and freedom of expression, 
to resist this request and the event went ahead. We, of course, instituted all our enhanced security protocol, lots of people uh, through campus operations who are the true heroes on these kinds of events. There's a boisterous uh, demonstration outside, just here, huge Greek flags, uh, but the event passed off peacefully. We were able to spirit the Deputy Prime Minister in and out uh, and no one noticed and so on. Now, so the first point, the first argument then is the socially constructed boundaries and their policing. The existence of Northern Cyprus and whether or not this is upsetting or troubling depends on where you stand, of course. It seems to be a social fact that Northern Cyprus exists even if that's contestable. The extraordinary efforts made to prevent the event from taking place, both internally and externally, I mean, the important thing is that these boundaries are policed externally as well, um, suggest that the denial of the existence of the state of Northern Cyprus is key to the strategy of some interested parties, and the opposite, of course, the Turkish society had an interest. So I think the production, reproduction, and policing of what is a legitimate or offensive claim, including a knowledge claim, is, happens through a social process which is both inside and outside the academy. I think that's something we always need to recognize. And I think in an academic community, we should actually be indifferent to the content of knowledge claims and only be concerned about the process of deliberation that tests their adequacy. And we do that through disciplines, peer review, academic status, the construction of expertise, and so on. So, I mean, David mentioned it, in my own field of climate change research, it's absolutely possible and allowable to claim that CO2 doesn't explain contemporary warming of the Earth's atmosphere. That's free of speech. But you would not be regarded as employable at most UK universities today if you made that claim. There are limits to academic freedom, and that's the crucial difference. Second point, quickly, and I've had my time already, as I can see, the complex interaction between academic freedom and freedom of expression. So I start with the claim that the policing of what is a reasonable claim from the perspective of, uh, of academic freedom is done by expert peers within the field of research. I think this is what the bill is also trying to say. But the policing of what is legitimate or acceptable claim from the perspective of freedom of expression is done by society as a whole. It's a much broader set of um, uh, actors who police that boundary. But within a university, we're actually responsible for regulating both, often at the same time. This is because freedom of expression is intrinsic to freedom, uh, academic freedom. So new discoveries, discoveries often made at the edges of what is deemed plausible uh, or, or indeed unlikely. But also because we have a social duty to encourage freedom of expression in our own community, to encourage the, the development of critical reasoning, tolerance, very important, and because we have a commitment to the democratizing influence of, of debate and dispute. In the case of Kudret Ozesai, we at King's had a duty to allow his claims to be heard and to be tested in discussion. And in doing so, we not only defended freedom of expression of Ozesai and of the student society who had invited him, but we also contributed to knowledge about Cyprus, the nature of political legitimacy, ideas of self-determination, Turkish-Greek relations, and so on in the wider university community. So I think you know, what we did was totally defensible. The final thing about both students and staff being covered by the rights and responsibilities here. I think just as freedom of expression and academic freedom are different, but often very difficult to disentangle in a university for the reasons I've just explained. So it's very difficult to separate where the rights and responsibilities should lie. One with the whole community of staff and students, and the other exclusively with academic staff. I think actually making that distinction is really very difficult. The right to hear and contest the future of Cyprus, including Northern Cyprus, apply to all those who were present at the event that day. And I would argue this also mattered to the whole of the university community, staff and students, whether they were there or not. While the procedures of regulating academic freedom may not apply directly to all our students. They certainly do to our research students, and I would probably add our master's students who are doing research theses. The aim of a, higher of, higher, of a higher education is to foster the values of critical thought amongst all our students who learn about and abide by procedures of academic research and peer review. I mean, that's what you're doing as a, as a student when you write your paper, for instance. 
So our own perspectives in the academy have changed about this, and I think this relates to something that was said earlier as well. We now speak about the co-creation of knowledge with our students, who are seen as participants in an engaged heuristic community, and that learning is indeed a two-way process. We can't separate one from the other. And more broadly, our research often now advocates often a co-production approach, which sees new knowledge as being created and reprodu reproduced throughout society, so that academic freedom. So in such a situation, it becomes much more difficult, actually, to argue that academic freedom is the province of the academic expert alone. There's a whole critique of what expertise is, of course. In fact, the responsibilities and rights associated with academic freedom may extend more broadly. So I just wanted to throw that in because, and working from my little case example. But thank you very much. Thank you. Well, look, we've had uh, three really interesting and illuminating contributions from our panelists. Now is an opportunity for people here to chip in. You may wish to make a brief comment from your own experience or ask a question from the panel. So I'm going to collect some interventions, then we'll go back to the panel to have a bit more discussion. But mainly, there are people here who are bursting to intervene. And if you wish to, now is an opportunity. And if you, if you could give... Ah, yes, there's a roving mic. And if you could give your name and organisation, that would be fantastic. Uh, OK, we'll start there, and then we'll go to the gentleman behind. Yep. Yeah, um, Bernard Casey. I'm a retired academic who spent many years in Germany, where we had a concept of academic freedom there, which is not being talked about at all, um, which had to do with the fact that you could spend 10 years in a university, and I used to watch this when I was sitting in Berlin, um, doing whatever you liked as a student, doing a bit of this, a bit of that, and going somewhere else for a while and going somewhere else. And that was an important part of academic freedom as one understood it there. The other thing which one understood there was that once you had become a professor, now the question was, how did you become a professor, of course? But once you had become a professor, you could do whatever you liked. And it was actually more or less impossible to do anything about what you were doing and how you did it and where you did it and when you did it. So that was the other. Those were the academic freedoms which I spent a large part of my professional life living with. And um, that notion of academic freedom is sort of very tangential to what has been said so far. Is it relevant at all? I'm not quite sure. But I think it's something which we need to recognize. Thank, Thank you. you. And then there was another intervention behind. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is E. K. Yang. I used to work for the New York Times here in London office. I'm an American citizen, uh, got my degree here in the UK. Uh, before choosing, before coming to the United Kingdom, I was a little bit struggled with the academic freedom between Columbia University and Cambridge. And then I ended up choosing Cambridge. Um, so speaking of the academic freedom, uh, we always say UK is either the model or the foil to the United States. Now, if we look around, the other way around, what UK should learn from the US in terms of the academic freedom, or what kind of thing should be avoided? Thank you. Ah, right. Now, we've got, it's interesting, we get two, we're getting two kind of international comparisons. And um, that is that, I think there's a third intervention, we could, there's a, and then we'll go back to the panel. So we've got a question about the German model, a question about the American model. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. I'm uh, Harry. I work for Universities UK, and I suppose while I've got the floor, thanks very much, Lord Willits, for the amendments you laid to the bill. Um, I'm interested, I guess, in how or where this leaves things like potentially the IRA definition of uh, anti-Semitism. Uh -huh. And that's obviously, I guess, that potentially looking at Nicola from her previous role, but um, I welcome yep. other thoughts and comments too, given that is something which... Uh, you know, is promoted and widely kind of encouraged for universities to adopt, but is also the subject of something which is kind of uh, subject to academic discussion and debate. Um, but then equally from a free speech angle, it could be seen to be something which encourages and protects Jewish students on campus. And so I suppose it's, it, any reflections, I guess, in terms of where we're, when we're thinking about this distinction, um, how and when should we be making it clear, uh, i.e. kind of academic freedom, where does that 
boundary lie within an academic setting and how does it differ to the sort of more social or extracurricular activities which we've also heard about yeah uh, i'm going to let's go through the panel again say well let's start with you nicola partly because that final question is which is indeed has come up a bit in the scrutiny of the bill is a, is a very pertinent one but uh, also as you looked around i mean the the baronial powers of the german professor and perhaps a difference uh, in academic protections to the US and the UK. Your observations on that as well? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a slightly easier question than the ARA definition <laughs> one. <laughs> Can I start with that? I mean, I think it, it, when one looks at the um, continental and the US approach to academic freedom, it feels very different to what we've got in the UK at the moment, certainly uh, as embodied in the bill. And I, I should actually say I'm not supporting the fact that students are excluded from a definition of academic freedom. I was just, I was just narrating what the bill okay. says. Um, but um, I, I think that broader conceptual values inspired approach that um, America and Germany adopt has the potential to be um, a much more accurate representation. But I think um, what I've read, and if, if I look at the European Convention definition, for example, the European Commission, sorry, proposal, um, there are constraints on academic freedom that would preclude that sort of um, free fall that you described in Germany. So I think some of the more recent definitions probably do um, constrain the definition of academic freedom. So it's not a free for all for anyone to mm. do whatever they want. Um, on the our definition, I mean, that is just such a challenge that I, I couldn't possibly answer it in any sort of coherent way in half a, half a minute. Um, it, it, I can't answer that question, and I, and it, I would be very interested to know how the UK is going right. to answer it. I, I, all I would observe is that um, when we deal with responses to IRA, um, I think it's incredibly um, important that we don't let the discourse sh slide into anti-Semitism. And, and that's why I'm slightly cautious about even coming up with any sort of knee-jerk response, because I think we have to be so careful about how that debate is framed. It is, I mean, just to observe, because there is a, some, so there's a very simple, well, vivid set of political examples about this. We know that on the day the legislation was first announced, Michelle Donnellan on the radio, then the responsible minister, was asked, does that mean that you are free to um, advocate Holocaust denial? To which she said, yes, you will have that freedom. And within 24 hours, number 10 had briefed that you wouldn't have that freedom. And that created several problems, one being that somewhere there was going to be a power that number 10 clearly thought they could exercise and which wasn't on the face of the bill that would enable somebody in authority to decide whether or not Holocaust denial was OK or not. So the very fact that number 10 could confidently say it wouldn't be, it was, it was actually became part of the problem. And Holocaust denial is not of itself a legal offence in the UK. It is in Germany, but it is not a legal offence in the UK. And it, ha it seems to me pretty clear from the face of the bill that therefore it does enjoy some kind of protection. And interestingly, there were attempts in the bill, even by, the, by people who in general were saying there's a terrible problem of freedom of speech being suppressed in British universities. They tried to bring in amendments specifically to exclude protections for Holocaust denial. So, but it is, a, it is a vivid example of some of the issues. Um, Naomi, your, your observations on all yeah. this. Yeah, I'll offer a few things. I'll try and cover each of them. In fact, I, I, perhaps I wasn't talking about the, the very recent experiences in the German university, although I've spent two years in German universities. I was, in fact, speaking about the modern German university when I spoke about uh, criticality as a foundation. I, I didn't want to bore you by giving you a lecture on Kant and how that fed mm. into the uh, foundation of the Humboldtian yeah. university. Yeah. But that was the conception, at least an inspiration for the conception I had in mind. Whether that's lived up to in the German modern university today is, uh, is another question. But it has also been the basis for how the American university has conceived itself, very much modeled on that. But then there have been considerable departures, influenced uh, largely by uh, the constitutional conception of free speech rights in, in the states. Um, but also the civil rights movement has moved uh, 
the needle considerably on both conceptions of free speech uh, and academic freedom in the US. I would suggest that we all watch what's happening in Florida with great care at the moment, where we see a, a perfect example of power trying to determine what truth is. Uh, the latest uh, version of that leg proposed legislation I've seen would outlaw the teaching of any critical theory, not only critical race theory, if that weren't already enough. Uh, I'm not suggesting we're close to that in the UK, um, but I think there are some instructive lessons uh, to learn about the risk of elevating free speech um, as something that should take priority on university campuses, because that is the rhetoric, and I've worked in the US for seven years, and that certainly was the rhetoric I saw, that we would trample on academic freedom in the name of free speech, Berkeley, Stanford, and so on. And some of the inspiration for my ideas has come from seeing the work of tireless advocates in places like Stanford, who have struggled to keep outright fascist speech off campuses in California, for example, because they do not meet the standards of critical rebuttal. And not because they are upsetting people or distressing, but they, they, they do not meet the standards, not disciplinary ones, but standards of argumentation, of thought, and so on. Um, on the IHRA, I'd also be uh, cautious to say much, except I'll say two things, that it's not well drafted as a definition for kind of more legal or policy use. I think I can say that without being controversial. It's difficult to segue that into kind of policy application or, or legal use. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's, that's probably the, the, the main thing to, to say there. Um, that uh, the other thing I suppose I'll underscore is that I do not, I'm not a lawyer, but I do not believe from all the work I, I've done and talking to lawyers that Holocaust denial would be permissible under this bill. I think number 10 is correct, and that's because of Article 17. We are still party to the European Convention on Human Rights, and that will simply not pass muster. It's not to be balanced against other rights. It's simply excluded from Article 10 protection. And so my view is that there should be no risk. Um, but I'm happy for lawyers in the room to step in. Friends? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think this sort of freedom to roam and, and freedom to do nothing, I don't think they really, really exist uh, any, in, in a British university, and nor do they really exist in German universities today, I think. That's the Bologna process, stopped all of that. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, uh, you know, just on, um, you know, sort of values-based, I mean, just to follow on the argument about, you know, Kant, Hegel and, and Humboldt, I mean, there's that, that German concept of Bildung, which I think mm. is really central to, you know, really useful conception of what, what we should be doing with students, particularly in a, in a, in a university, which is, <clears throat> you know, and not just teaching them things, but, you know, inculcating them with certain values to do with the pursuit of truth and, and tolerance and, you know, breadth and being able to have a conversation with people you disagree with and and being open and curious i mean that that's that's what we're trying to do and i think every time we we you know and i, I you know probably you know may, may may differ from you know the the idea of having tight definitions i mean tight definitions are good but they they do injury uh, to to what is actually culturally trying to you know, happening in in a university and i i would I would I would say that that is actually so so important. I mean, just on anti-Semitism, I mean, of course, it is again going back to my experience of working uh, in, in, trying to regulate these kinds of events. We, you know, most of the difficulties we 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 have in universities are to do with um, the Middle East. I mean, no doubt about that. Those are the most difficult events to manage and police. And I I remember very vividly a Palestinian. Um, speaker coming, huge opposition from um, the Israeli, the Israel society, you know, all the letters coming in beforehand and, you know, the determination that it would go ahead, high levels of security, ticketed, everyone's name was there, it was all, all managed. And a very large group from the Israel society came and sat in the front row, front row. but it was a big uh, uh, audience lots of people in the room you know what came across for me in that event was how well everyone behaved mm -hmm. you know one of the things about people in such a situation that's why i think the practical reality is something you have to go to 
the reality in such a situation that everyone then wants to be sure that they're behaving properly, that they're listening. There's no shouting. I mean, the shouting is all outside, frankly. The people are not in the room are the ones who are misbehaving and causing difficulties. The people in the room know they're being watched. They know they're being responsible. They want to be responsible. These Palestinian action, Palestine action group the, of students here were some of the most sophisticated students we had. They were all medics and lawyers, and they were very, you know, nuanced on all these issues, and they wanted to run the thing in the proper way. So my own sense is that, you know, I know people worry about all these things, but actually anti-Semitism didn't show its head on that night. It really didn't. There was no way. Later, of course, we got lots of letters from all sorts of Jewish advocates outside who'd not been in the room and they were complaining that what had happened was an outrage and, and so on. I think in the university we can hold a ring, we can create these safe spaces, and what happens is very civil and very good and, a, and an interchange. So let's believe in that. It really happens. Yeah. Very interesting. I'd, I'd like to add one comment of my own to the German and American examples, which is to say they are also on a spectrum of labor market regulation and protections. Uh, and in, in Germany, it's still the case that there have been some changes that labor market protections for people's jobs are particularly intense, greater protections than in the UK. And America, of course, labor market protections are far weaker than the UK. And one thing that was interesting, look, and I come at this from way back in the 1980s, being heavily involved in Thatcherism and free market reform and free labor markets. Uh, when you look at what protections Britain has against the worst of American cancel culture and uh, social media hysteria about what someone should have, may have said and drive him or her out of some organization. Labor market protections and employment rights are quite a good protection. And indeed, in the course of this bill going through Parliament for scrutiny, what was striking how at several points the minister referred to employment rights and protections as something that was related to academic freedom in one sense. And um, it's very, when we get into cases such as Kathleen Stock, one of the, one of the sort of under-investigated aspects of the Kathleen Stock affair was what employment protections she had and it's pretty clear to me that she did have very strong employment rights to carry on working at that university. Of course, it was a very difficult environment for her. I'm not judging her behavior, but she had employment rights. And I would argue that it's interesting, those two examples, and one reason why perhaps the British environment will remain uh, rather better than the American one is if there is a social media storm around you, you have greater protections to stay where you are than you would have in the US. That is, that is well and good, but that protects, sorry, David, that, that, that's well and good, but that, that protects the between inverted commas tenured professor. It also protects the tenured professor in um, the United States, I would suggest. It certainly protects the beampted professor in Germany. The issue is not those people, it's the people who are employed in very large numbers in UK universities I know about and in um, German universities as well, who are not employed on that basis. And it is what they say, and they make up an awful lot of the let's say, the lower levels of the teaching. And they're the people whose views um, are acceptable or not acceptable. And that comes back to what we were talking about, I don't know, was it a couple of weeks or so ago in Port Cullet's house about the extent to which and the views that you can teach. And here the discussion was primarily about China and what you could say about China. And I was involved in some of that research which was talked about on, on that occasion. It's the junior staff who can potentially offend the university by 
saying the wrong things within their discipline as social scientists, as economists. And that's what concerns well, me. There is, a, we indeed, there is a wider debate about casualisation and such like, but I would say the mood in our parliamentary debates on this was that the employment rights go beyond the groups you're describing. And if anything, interestingly, the, the people who are worried about um, free speech are talking about, I ended up focusing very much on guest lecturers, outsiders, people from one place being asked to speak in another place. They, they accepted some of the comments that were made about employment law. Anyway, we must get some other intervention. I want another round. Yes. Uh, gentlemen there, we'll yeah. start there now and then I hope there'll be some other interventions as well. Yeah, yeah um, Rob Copeland from, from the UCU, so unfortunately I'm going to echo a little bit what the previous colleague said, and I do think that the German case, um, the majority of people are on highly precarious contracts, even higher levels than here, so I think that kind of model of the civil servant as professor is very much a minority of the, of the German system. Um, so I, I wanted to say, again just echo the comments, I think I'm not sure during the bill there was a lot of kind of big focus on the issue around the employment, the labour market conditions in the UK. And I think that's been a bit of a problem of the debate even since HERA was established. There hasn't been that issue of contractual status and how it has a, a, you know, an, an informal or indirect impact on freedoms to teach and research hasn't really been figured. And I, I think that is a gap. But I wanted to just mention some of the other factors about the extent to which you kind of mark the more marketized HE system around governance, uh, around kind of performance management and, and, and metrics, um, and the, the increasing constraints to criticize your institution for fear of, you know, bring it into disrepute. I, I just wondered what colleagues, you know, can we get more attention on that as well? Because there's obviously a lot of focus on freedom of speech, but some of these more subtle pressures that do undermine um, the, the capacity to undertake or exercise academic freedom in the, this country and elsewhere, I don't think have been brought, brought to attention, either during the bill or more generally in debates on sort of public policy. So I'd like to hear your thoughts yeah. on, on foregrounding those a bit more than has been the case in recent, recent years. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's a very, very intervention. We'll, we'll come to that. I'm going to carry on collecting Interventions, yes. Uh, leave you and then behind you. Maybe. So this is a fascinating discussion, no less because all the disagreements that uh, <laughs> that are, are coming up. So uh, 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 a couple of, uh, of of points, you know, thinking of the of the topic uh, of the of the evening, and also again, um, uh, you know, trying to be to be practical eventually, and you know this. Philosophical discussions are extremely practical, as a as a as a as a matter of fact. So I I think if we are asking ourselves, you know, is the current situation okay with regard to conceptualization, codification of academic freedom, and freedom of speech, or the processes that we are witnessing are okay? And I would say no, none of them is okay for several reasons. So uh, and you know that will be a, a long a series of uh, arguments or, uh, or or comments. So if we if we take the uh, European Convention of Human Rights, it didn't work in the case of Lex EU. It could not be used in many cases uh, uh, here or elsewhere for different reasons. Because as you said, Naomi, it is uh, it is incomplete. It you know, uh, no concerns on certain aspects or academic freedom of academic practice. It is fundamentally about freedom of academic expression, leaving out other important parts. It is also framed as a human right, while academic freedom is many things. It is a value, it is a human right, it is a fundamental right, it is a governance principle, and we don't have a conceptual reference that brings all this together and makes it you know, applicable. So, you know, when we have a when we have a, a case, you know, as head of school, I tell my colleagues, no, you cannot use this research method, or I will not support your research application. I cannot invoke any human rights legislation, right? But it is—is is it a matter of academic freedom? It is a matter of, of academic freedom. So, my point is that at present there is a need to work 
towards reimagining academic freedom. And I'm not talking about definitions. I am talking about references, conceptual references, that would be sufficiently shared, up to date, and effective. Because we have a lot of good definitions that are not used mm -hmm. anywhere, a lot of documents that are not used anywhere. And I know some, some people say, but don't talk about new things. Just apply what we have. And uh, I know Rob Quinn, the director, executive director of Scholars at Risk, who might be listening, as a, as a matter of fact, has been making this point for a long while until he changed his mind. He said, oh, maybe there is a need to rethink what is, uh, what is happening. And if we think specifically about academic freedom and freedom of speech, so my point, sloppy as it is, uh, is that they are different. They are both important, but they need to be codified separately and anew. And it is a question who should do this uh, uh, codification, thinking of, of policing and all this. But what, what we see that is happening, not only in the UK, is that these codifications are happening without the universities taking a part of that, and not for the better. And this is the last thing I'm saying. If we, if we look at the, uh, at the bill that we are talking about, and I have said this earlier, it is not about freedom of speech in general. It is not about academic freedom. It is about freedom of speech on campus. But why is it needed to have a freedom of speech law for a special category, for academics and students eventually, and uh, administrative staff? Is there a need for other, for such laws for other professional categories? I don't know, for the clergy, or for the military, or for uh, truck drivers. And I'm not trying to, to make light, or, these are important categories, but imagine a law of freedom of speech on highway. No, nobody wants that. So you know, there is a justification to think about freedom of speech on campus because that is absolutely needed for academics and students and members of the university community to deliver on their duty, which is production, transmission, uh, dissemination, curation of knowledge as a public good. But that then is not freedom of speech. It's academic freedom. So, you know, legislating for a special category belongs to this, and I think Noemi put it rightly, it is not only reducing academic freedom to, to freedom of speech, but misconstruing both in, in, in a certain way. Thank you. Now, the, uh, I, yes, behind you, yes, there we are. Thank you, thank you for the really interesting discussion. My name is Nia, and I am a student. I'm, um, I'm part of the student newspaper, Roar News. I encourage you to uh, get um, the new print edition if you see it around campus. Um, <clears throat> my question is, as a student, it, the idea is about um, the pursuit of truth, values-influenced um, approach, and openness to talk to people you disagree with. This really resonates with me. But my question is, how do we make sure that academics and students are on the same page practically? How can we do that? Yep. Thank you. That's a very fair challenge. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I'm going to pause there. I, I, there's another round. Well, we're going to try to squeeze in one more round of questions after that. But we've already got a fair amount of material. And I'm going to start with Franz this time. And, and actually, let's try to focus a bit. This question, for you as a social scientist and involved in running of this university, the, the, the very legitimate question about governance, about universities as institutions, um, about uh, terms of employment for staff. How, how does that play into academic, the academic freedom debate? Do you want particularly to comment on that issue? Though? Feel free to comment on the other interventions as well. Well, I, I think classically, and I think this was a point made by the colleague talking about Berlin, uh, particularly in Germany, um, uh, yeah, academic freedom was very much to do with tenure, and it was the you know the protection you had from the state uh, to say whatever you you wanted, and clearly that is an important way in which, as you've said, you you stabilise academic freedom. Um, you know, I'm 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 sure the general point you make must be true. But I'm, I'm, I'm not expert enough or know of details of cases where people, for instance, on fixed-term contracts have been threatened in some way with curtailed to make certain statements within the, their professional work as teachers or researchers uh, that has led to the end of their contract. So I, I certainly... As, as, as dean here at, at, at King's, 
uh, for seven years, never saw a case like that at all. So yeah, I've never seen a case like that. I'm sure there might be a concern that might be self-censorship, for instance. I mean, it might be that people who know that they need to go on back onto the job market, having been a postdoc here or, um, you know, a, a fixed term lecturer, um, you know, are concerned that's something you, you might be concerned about. But to be honest, I think the reality is that, and let me put it the other way, certainly as a social scientist, your success in the end is going to be around being noticed within your discipline for a statement, a claim, a piece of research uh, that you have done. And it's more likely that that will happen uh, if you are somewhat averse or controversial. I mean, if you just confirm what everyone else already knows, then you're not going to get cited. No one's going to be talking about it and so on. You need to be advancing. And it seems to me that for young academics, and I was on part-time contracts for most of my career, actually, uh, the drive to innovate may be stronger amongst people who are looking for the next job. And therefore, pushing the boundaries is something that is a sort of intrinsic to your career progress, actually. So I don't know. You can reverse. I suppose I, I, I'm reversing the argument slightly, whether that's correct or not. But certainly here at King's, I wouldn't say that there have been cases of fixed term contracts with, with, with people. I mean, so, so, so that's what I would say about that. I'm, I'm probably going to stop there because I've rambled on a bit. <laughs> yeah. Naomi, do you, do you want to particularly to, to focus on Livio's question? And this, to what extent can we rely on this this reservoir of wisdom, especially from the European court that you were referring to earlier, and to what extent do we need innovation? Where are you in, in this debate? Sure, absolutely. I'll, I'll say one thing to Rob's point as well afterwards. So thanks, Livio. As you know, I'm very sympathetic to your projects and I'm, I'm working with you and, and others in this area. So I think it is very key that we reimagine academic freedom, as you put it. And I do think we need a, a far better collective sort of common understanding and culture of that. And that speaks also to your comment um, about how to bring students and, and staff together to work on that, um, bringing the right education. What does academic freedom look like for students when they're kind of learning uh, these forms of criticality and dialogue and so on? So I think that's very important. But I don't think we need to necessarily exclude those resources that we have. It's not a question simply of applying them. The problem with case law, of course, is you've just got to keep going through and wait for new cases, and they'll only touch on particular things depending on the facts. So it will never be a comprehensive vision, perhaps, in the form that we want. So yes, uh, very heartily supportive of that. And if I can just very quickly mm. say one thing about um, Rob's kind of comments about those other kinds of pressures on academic, like de facto academic freedom rather than law. And I'll just speak from the experience of what I have at Warwick, um, which is that the Academic Freedom Review Committee chair sits, has been now put on the policy oversight group um, so that all policies in the university and all guidance accompanying policies is reviewed by that person as a part and, and debated. Um, and while I don't think this doesn't solve, obviously, problems of working conditions or casualizations, and Rob does not need me to school him on methods for doing for pushing on that, but it does mean that when we say get a policy on flexible working hours or we get a policy that will affect uh, leavers, fellowships returning from maternity leave and so on, that we can always make an eye to it of where those things might infringe on academic freedom understood in the broadest sense. And so far, all those recommendations have been taken up within my institution with some discussion and back and forth with senior management. But they are, I would say, beginning to have an effect in understanding how academic freedom relates to working conditions. So I would, I would advocate the sector as a whole embrace uh, understanding academic freedom effect a broad range of policies and activity in the university. Thank you. Uh, Nicola, your observations, perhaps you might particularly, having been the head of the Office for Students, touch on that, that, <laughs> that intervention about the student perspective. Yeah, yeah and it's a really important mm. perspective. And can I make yeah, a point yes, which point. ties that in also to um, perhaps a bridge between the broader principles that Livia and Naomi and Franz and everyone's been talking about and supporting, and the rather depressed comments I was making about the narrowness of the legislation, proposed legislation. 
Because I think the way through this is um, by having a clear line of sight of the role of um, autonomous institutions, autonomous universities with governing bodies, because the way the regulation, I will get back to the student's point, by the way, but the way the regulation is going to be structured is that it's going to be up for, to individual universities to determine in their governing documents what their approach is going to be to both academic freedom and free speech. And that's going to be hugely influential because what the regulator will then do, and the director for free speech and academic freedom will do, is to look at how the university has cast these concepts and also how they are implementing them in practice. So what this means is that actually the, the approach of the university is going to be really fundamental. And it won't just influence the regulator, I think it will influence the courts as well. So, so the way through this is for universities to have a very clear conception of what academic freedom and free speech is. So they can turn around this subordination of um, academic freedom and free speech, and they can do it the way we want it, which is academic freedom first and then free speech underneath that. And I think if there's a compelling case, um, then that will have a huge influence, actually, in terms of how this is determined. I think there's a huge role for UK here, actually, um, in terms of you know making sure that it's not just you know fantastic universities that we've got represented here, uh, but it's across the piece that there's a compelling narrative. Mm -hmm. And I think to go to finish on the student point, I, I think students have to be part of this. I, I can't see any way that they're not a really central part of thinking about academic freedom and free speech, because so much of this has been cast in a really sort of negative, students are the problem. It's just so untrue and so unfair. And I think students need to be embraced in the development of the governing documents dealing with academic freedom and free speech. And that seems to me the positive way forward here. Um, fascinating. I did, I'd just like to add two observations of my own. First of all, on this question of governance and academic freedom in the university environment, it is, I think, worth looking at it from a historical perspective. And I was thinking, as we were talking about it, of the Truscott book, Red Brick, which coined the expression Red Brick and is a wonderful short book written in the late 30s. Um, and his book, the, the dominant theme of his book is academics complaining about the power of the civic authorities that had created their universities. So we love the word civic now. Civic, civically, civic rooted university is very fashionable. They've got to have much closer contact to the local community. This is be basically an academic complaining about the local councillors who turn up and think just because they funded it and set aside some parkland for their civic university to set up, think they can come up, turn up, and decide whether or not there should be a, a new professor of Spanish appointed or not. It is a, it is a complaint against civic governance and local bigwigs and best because he's the largest employer or he's, he's been mayor he thinks he can run the university so it is worth remembering there was there was not a golden age when there was a high level of autonomy and that was the threat and of course um, public funding post-war public funding one of its main effects was to weaken the power of the traditional those, those traditional civic authorities um, on the on the student question, uh, I'm going to. This is this is. I do think that there is a generational gap that has opened up, and it's complicated to explain. And um, the the link between views and identity does matter more for younger people, and. Um, and where I think these critical theories have had an impact, and in some ways I think it has been a pernicious impact. People are entitled to express their ideas, but the language itself, which we're all trying to protect people's freedom to use language, once language is seen as one of the instruments of oppression that people use, then of course all the pressures for self-censorship, being careful what you say, judge your words, all come in because we have been because the doctrine is these are the one of the most oppressive things you've got and i love the kind of high kantian account of principles but one of the i think it's derrida's essay is an attack on kantian high he attacks kant's um uh writings and um 
Conflict of the Faculties, which I think is a wonderful essay about the university, precisely because he thinks Kant is completely naive about trying to set, because he's particularly pro the philosophy school, philosophers love Kant, he, but the, he, he's, it's an attack on, he, Kant is naive about the power behind all these inst institutions, so it's made it harder for a classical liberal. That's why I've noticed every time France has to sort of say, well, of course, he's starting with this, what's now seen as almost naive about the instruments of oppression available for use by people who think they are classical liberals, that's a much harder position to defend now when there's a group of very eloquent arguments that language itself is part of the problem. So I do, and I think young, for, and I think younger people are susceptible to that type of view. Of the world. So I do think bridging the gap is harder, but the role of the university is a crucial place where that gap can and and should be bridged. Now we're going to have one last round of questions. Let's start there. Um, Anne Corbett from LSE. Um, what I wondered was, um, can uh, what does academic freedom look like from the point of view of the public? Oh. And can it be separated from a respect for the authority of academics? I mean, it's partly inspired by your reference to Florida, but it's um, clearly uh, in a contentious political climate. Uh, academics are slagged off. Yeah. Yes, that's now. Uh, this is the last opportunity. Any other? Oh, yes. Here at the front. Yeah. Hi, I'm James Murray, I'm a lawyer. I've got a very general question and a more specific one. The general question is, if you'd had a blank piece of paper, how would you have designed the new higher edu education bill? The most, <laughs> the most specific Left it one, blank. <laughs> <laughs> the Sorry. most specific one is for, is for Nicola. How do you think the new director and the new duties for the OFS will change the relationship between the OFS and universities? Do you think the OFS will now be much more directive towards universities on these issues. Right. And let's let Nicola, the, that's so, uh, you, you no longer have those, why, why didn't you set the ball right? And, and you're more, uh, more widely, this is your final observations final. on the debate. Okay. Um, the specific point, no, I don't think it's going to affect the relationship because I think um, the director is, I hope, will produce guidance that will be of genuine assistance in a very contested space. So I think it could add value. Um, and also, as I said before, the way the um, <coughs> obligations are going to be constructed um, through the bill is, is, as you know, through the management and governance conditions. So I think there's going to be a respect for institutional autonomy. So I don't, I don't think that will make it... You know, I live in hope. I don't think it's going to... Um, jeopardise relations um, and with luck it will add value um, on on this acad res public perception of academics um, and that's partly why I raised the example uh, look I, I deplore the public critique I, th I, I think it's a, a really worrying trend but having said uh, and there's no but ifs or buts actually but the reason I um, raised this question about quality and whether academic freedom is going to be invoked as a way of not addressing the quality of students' experience. I think it's very relevant to that because I think there is a public perception that students are not getting a good deal. Um, and that was exacerbated by COVID for obvious reasons. Um, and um, I, I, do, I do worry that unless we are better as a sector, I say we, I very much include myself in this, in in demonstrating the importance of teaching and learning, the importance of students' experience, of ensuring that teaching is not subordinate to research. Unless we are better at that, then I think there is always a risk that the public will carry on critiquing the higher education sector. And I think um, a, a misuse of academic freedom could play into that in a really unhelpful way. Yes, thank you. Naomi? Um, in the spirit of academic freedom, I'm going to disagree with Nicola on this point and say I don't believe primarily it's the public that's attacking academic freedom or academic authority. I think this is the work of elite actors looking to change public opinion, chiefly through many of the uh, 
techniques of rhetoric that are not proper to academic freedom. So I suppose my answer to engaging with the public or how um, the public ought to see academic freedom and the role of academics in society is in service of a common good. Um, and part of that common good is inculcating cultures of being able to disagree well and through contentious debate that is, is not simply dogmatic or propagandist, um, but is able to be um, amenable, reflexive, refine itself, improve itself and I, I suppose I'd like to see you know a situation where the public um, is able to be exposed to those kinds of debates and arguments through the democratization of education and higher education in particular and therefore for it not to seem hostile and, and for them to be less likely to be seduced by the arguments of certain elite actors. So I suppose that, that's probably a controversial opinion but as I'm exercising my academic freedom I'm <laughs> going to go for it. <laughs> I, I actually agree with you. I mean, I, you <laughs> the know, classical liberal. Yeah. No, I mean, actually, look, um, you know, is, is, is the public very wary of universities? Look, the reason I, I think there is a public debate about universities is because, you know, we become so powerful and important. You know, when half of people go through universities, then it's quite right that we become a social actor of massive importance not just economically, but culturally, um, with real political power. And of course, the scrutiny then increases. I mean, I think actually the public is completely schizophrenic about the universities and academics. You know, there are more academic experts than ever. If you turn on the radio and people listen to them, people are very well informed. You know, there's a lot of you know, science being uh, you know, reported. In, in society. People talk about the microbiome and brain relations now in a way that, you know, in very well, they're all in social media, mum's net, they're, they, you know, it's, it's everywhere. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm maybe totally complacent about this. Half the people are coming to us. More and more people are turning up every year. We can't, you know, we can't grow fast enough, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they respect mostly what we do. Of course, they're going to criticise occasionally what we do, but that's only right. The scrutiny will increase, uh, and we absolutely need to take teaching and education and learning a central task of what we do. We need to, well, what, we, what we do is, is not good enough there, often, and we need to sharpen our rag, but that is, that is something within our control. So I'm not actually at all worried about public opinions about universities. I'm sorry. If everybody, if everybody agrees what we are doing, maybe we don't need what we are doing. So they need to be criticized us, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Well, there's certainly uh, universities, and that's and those are some wonderful points about the importance of university and the growing centrality in national life and popularity. Of course, controversy and. Um, uh, popular concern about what happens in universities is not new. Uh, and indeed, it's interesting, you were referring to the Turkish issue, Turkey, the Turkish Cypriots and the Greeks. Um, when I arrived as a junior official in the Treasury in my first job when I joined the civil service, my boss in the Treasury, who went on to have a very senior career and ended up as a, as a permanent secretary, she was proud of her role in the Garden House riot in Cambridge, which was, of course, a Greek, when the Greek military junta was in power in the early 60s. Uh, and there was a big protest at the one of the, I don't know if it was the Greek, I don't know which per, what person it was from the government. It was his visit to Cambridge that led to the, wow. the famous riot. And um, that got a lot of, uh, media coverage at the time, and she ended up, as I said, as a dame and a, and a permanent secretary. <laughs> so there are so this thing goes through cycles of massive turbulence, and then and then uh, things quieten down. We are going through. I do think, uh, and here I think we just, I do think there is a bit of an issue, and we have not. I'm not with one minute to go. Uh, I'm in danger of reopening this incredibly fraught issue, but I think the whole transgender stuff has had cut through, and by the time for the Maybe for the uh, academic freedom for the, um, that community, it's Kathleen Stock, because it does seem to me that Material Girls is a serious work of 
someone also is a trained philosopher trying to write a serious account and the fact that for whatever reason her position became untenable at university I think is is should be a source of deep regret for the higher education community um, but more widely it's JK Rowling and uh, Jermaine Greer and a group of feminists widely respected feminists who find themselves disinvited and challenged. So I don't, I think we shouldn't be too complete. I think that is where um, pressures and attitudes and some behavior in higher education has got detached from where the wider public is uh, and has been, as we know in the Essex case, sometimes it's also involved a misunderstanding of the basic legal protections and what constitutes the protected characteristics that are to be respected. So, uh, I, and that I suspect is the real backdrop to the legislation we've got now. Uh, I'm, I think that a power for the OFS does make sense. I remain skeptical, deeply skeptical about whether the taught right of encouraging civil litigation makes sense. And indeed, um, I argue throughout the passage of the bill that I was familiar with so many public policy issues when people had thought of whether there was a litigation type solution and whether there was a regulation type solution. But to try to run both in parallel seemed to me in ris at risk of creating confusion. And my friend and, and colleague Joe Johnson intervened and he, he made the point. He thought trying to run litigation alongside the regulation was, um, was weakening and confusing the world of the OFS. So I would have had a a regulatory approach and we've ended up as of yesterday with a position where litigation is only available after uh, all of the regulatory approaches have been gone through and if a person has a legitimate reason for thinking that those have been in some way inadequate and if they have a direct loss that they can show so we have constrained the litigation approach but I think a power for the OFS in the light of the public concern that there was doesn't make sense. Well, look, we've had, uh, we were just scheduled to end at half past eight, and it's, um, it's been a really interesting discussion. We're very grateful to our three panelists for your contributions. Very grateful to Livia as well, who has, has made such an impact on this debate nationally, indeed internationally. And I think we're all entitled to enjoy a glass of wine. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>